hello everyone from a kind of wet Harrogate in Yorkshire for where the Worlds the Worlds are being held this year. Uh, this is a Worlds special edition podcast. We'll do a bit of a recap of the event so far. So here with Kev and Danny. Hi Matt and hi Danny. Great to be here. Hello. Really nice to be here. Like you say, today actually it was quite sunny, but yesterday for the under 23 time trial and the elite women's time trial it was horrendous weather unfortunately quite a lot of crashes in the under 20 23 time trial women had a little bit of better luck um, with their timing for the time trial but hoping that the sun will be shining now throughout but yeah you never know at Yorkshire. I have been careful not to say typical British word when I talk to people <laughs> back in Australia but so far this has been typical <laughs> uh, and that that's in the N23s, the I think it's Danish fella, um, European champ, European twenty three time trial champ, he went down, yeah, hard. An understatement. Poor <laughs> poor chap. And obviously the, the the rain was covering half the road, head down and yeah, just went through the puddle. Yeah, I think a lot of people were saying, Why did he not just avoid it? You know, you could avoid the puddle and I think that's why they did then put cones out for the women. But, you know, knowing what it's like to be so focused on your event, you are looking for the fastest line and you're in you know, full focus of, of riding as fast as you can. So you don't really look out for, for puddles. And I don't think any of them anticipated just how deep they were. So yeah. unfortunately, it looked like they'd been swimming quite soon after hitting <laughs> hitting those yeah, puddles. Yeah. It certainly did provide some uh, amazing YouTube uh, footage, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it certainly did. Poor, poor chap. I think he got up pretty quickly, but probably the adrenaline, adrenaline running. But uh, we got three... Yeah, great, great chats. Three guests for this podcast, and we take them already one at a time. But starting looking at the events in chronological order, the mixed, mixed relay, mixed time trial relay. First off, obviously a fairly new event, only been ridden once at the Europeans before. What do you guys make of the event? Yeah, look, new event. I think it's great that the UCI are trying something new and something different. I guess I think it comes from perhaps the triathlon scene where they have the mixed relay there. Um, it's been quite successful so in terms of uh, drawing the crowds in and um, providing some sort of entertainment it certainly did that for us yeah I was actually quite skeptical about the event beforehand but I actually think it went down really well and I think it was a really entertaining event that worked well so I think now it's been you know set for the first time I think there will be a lot of countries now building on that event in the future because I think it was a really good event I don't think you can look at it as parity for the sport I think it's a standalone event that went down really well but yeah I, I personally really enjoyed it yeah so it's nice to see you know it's a very technical event uh, I think you know looking at the the British and again Dan Dan Bigham is uh, one, one of our guests and we got that chat coming up in a minute but he's, he calls himself an aerodynamicist. Um, and he's all about, you know, being yeah su super slippery and being as smart as he can. And I think he probably openly admit uh, the, the, the British team probably weren't the third physically strongest team, but certainly with the, the tech and the science and the an an analytics, which is all part of the game, part of you know, technology, they, they got that bronze medal. Yeah, but I think it actually effectively became a two-man time trial for most people because the course was very undulating mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and quite technical. They were losing a rider quite early. It ended up being a two-person team time trial, not two-man time trial. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what another strength of the Brits where they actually finished as a as a three. The men did. But obviously, the Dutch they they're taking it seriously as well. They're world class. You know, the it's an all world tour. World Tour team, mm. of six World Tour riders. Yeah, and I think if you look up at the lineup of the riders in the Dutch squad, you know, they have really taken it seriously. I think on the men's side in the British squad, you had a full time trial specialist team. On the women's side, not so much. So I think that is where you will see it develop, almost in a way like the team pursuit on the track, where the countries will then get behind the event and the specialist time trial riders will invest in the event in itself to become world champion ultimately. Well, talking about the mixed TT uh, relay, here's, here's the chat with British rider Dan Bigham. He was um, Dan Bigham, who was one of the first medalists. I can think about it, you're probably literally one of the first people to get a medal around your neck. Yeah, quite literally, yeah. Bronze medal in the, in the mixed relay. Well yeah. done. Thank you. Pretty happy with it, to be honest. It's a really fun day out, I guess. There's been loads of major events I've done before and they feel really pressured and yeah, you've got that weight of expectation to perform. Whereas in this one, it was an unknown. We were underdogs and we were like 150 to one. We were seeded in the first heat, which is like the slow guys, yeah. I guess. Um, 
yeah, and pulled out of the bag. Yeah, absolutely. And when when did you get selected? Uh, so it varied actually. We we got sort of prompted pretty early on, back in June, at the nationals, sort of like top five, top ten in men's and women's. Were asked, are you interested? Okay. We, we don't know what's what it's going to be like, yeah, but yeah. Let's, let's find out who's keen. Uh, and then six weeks out, so good good bit of time ago, myself, John, and Howie were pretty much given. Yeah, look, you probably got it. At, like start preparing Amazing. and then the girls was a little bit closer they i think they selected the team about three weeks out and then Fifey george had a bit of a, an accident because of a concussion which knocked her out and then that brought joss in and yeah so yeah they had two weeks prep it's a bit tight yeah wow yeah. That's, that's amazing and from the outside looking at what you do i mean and we'll go into more about you and in, in a different different podcast but it seems as if you're kind of the anchor in the who what like stuff so you're you're a bit of the anchor and kind of coordinating the team is that the role you played with with gb for the relay yeah, probably let a little bit of the control out, which is quite nice to to Ian Cook and Andy Pink. So GB had basically put two, relatively speaking, new coaches to it, um, yeah. I guess, because it didn't have the weight of expectation of, for example, like the individual time trial that qualifies them for the Olympics. Yeah. In this case, it was kind of, let's see how it goes. So it's, let's get some new experience for these coaches. And so I did a lot on the, the nerdy side, on the, the maths modeling and trying to predict how we should ride the course and then they did all the sort of leg work as it were on like the videos and pulling together all the the little documents that make lives easier for pulling apart the course sure yeah and just touch on that nerdy bit just to explain a little bit more detail what do you mean by that so yeah where do you even start in short using a mathematical model that i pulled together over the well i guess the last good few years that we've used a lot in team pursuit same physics just out on the road you put in cda crr critical power anaerobic work capacity all variables that define either how much energy you can produce or where your energy goes i.e to your aerodynamics which yep. is your drivetrain uh, and using that physics you can pretty much predict what the optimal way of riding a course is with a finite amount of energy to use and it was basically doing that iteratively on okay well, what happens if you put this rider in front going into this section or that draft and they corner and you're sitting on where do you save your energy how much energy you then have later to use yes. on another climb and just stepping through until we end up with a basically a pacing profile and when who's doing what on the front and when yeah awesome and i think going back people viewed i guess the team time trial event back in the day in the 80s was like you know the strongest team wins now it's not the strongest it's the smartest and tech plays a massive part and you're obviously a massive advocate of this new new world of cycling yeah i much prefer it as well it kind of adds a new dimension instead of like you say being the outright powerhouses which it always has been people yeah. once you've got a power meter suddenly everyone has like competition of well, how big your numbers can be yeah. was, i think we're on the other end of the spectrum of how small can your numbers yeah. be and you still win uh because yeah I mean, at the end of the day we beat some big names you've got tony martin and who else was there yos van emden yeah. uh viviani like not small guys a dutch team or all, all tour riders yeah scary and, uh, they weren't that far ahead of you um it's a bunch yeah. of big names away there yeah but you know what What's, what, what, what do you think if you were to do the event again, what would you change? I mean, you know, reflecting, you must be that type of type of mind. Yeah, I haven't dug into the numbers quite as deep as I wanted to yet. Uh, I've just been a bit tied up doing other bits and bobs and helping yeah. other people at the world. But um, I think thinking back, there's not a great deal we could have done better. There's probably a few little details on practicing more full gas efforts on closed courses, but it's, okay. it's so hard around here being effectively half it in the town centre yeah. that you're always getting caught up by a roundabout yeah. traffic light or whatever it might be. Uh, so that was quite hard to do, but... I think in practice, is, is we barely put a foot wrong. And yeah. normally I'm fairly critical of ourselves. But thinking back, there's very little else we could have really done on that day. I mean, maybe riding it in the wet because we hadn't experienced that. But we, I mean, we tried. Can't control that. Yeah, we, we've been here for seven or eight different days. Yeah. And every single day has been dry and warm, yeah. which is rare. But yeah. uh, maybe for the girls, I think if we'd had more time with them, especially because Anna and Lauren, they don't ride to power, which for me makes my life wow. a little bit hard on the pacing front. Sure. Uh, so I think we could have, yeah, unlocked a little bit more potential around, around the girls' side, but it was very late in the day when they came on board. So I think they did an outrageously good job to, to pull it, put that ride in. And uh, Anna really rode out of her skin. I think yeah. she, she'd be the first to admit she wasn't having a great time a couple of weeks out after, I think it was the Bowls Women's Tour, where she had a few get downs and, yeah, pulled out on the day. And those last six minutes, she was just on another level. Yeah. It's basically a tour series on yeah. Stoke on Trent in the rain, and she was very <laughs> happy with it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's great to see on the podium all you guys and what, what it meant to you. You know, that shot where you like literally eyes closed, clenching your fist. That's amazing to see. I just enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It just you never expect to be up there on a yeah. on a really world champs podium at your home yeah. home world championships and home world champs. That's, home world champs. That's never going to happen again, is it? Uh, yeah, you got time. family and friends and coach, and everyone's literally standing right in front of you on the podium. And it's not even five minutes. We were there for a good hour, hour and a half, and yeah. like set up camp there and yeah. having your tough wear lunch and yeah. everything else. It was <laughs> quite surreal in a way, but it definitely did mean a lot and. 
yeah, counting down those rallies, the Swiss were so close. And then obviously the Italians were neck and neck and they had a bit of bad luck with uh, Lamborghini. She was punctured and then yeah. rode back on, which was, that was unreal, eh? scary. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's just, um, good, great, obviously great, great event. And the mixed team talent trial relay, or mixed relay, that's an event to stay now by the sounds of it. It seems to be a lot of good press around it. Um, obviously the second edition uh, after the Europeans, it's the second edition that's been... So you're your advocate of the of the event? Oh, massively so. I think it's a good dynamic. Team time trials and time trials in general, people kind of have it as like a foregone conclusion. You get the first time check, whoever's ahead, probably going to hang yeah. on for the win, yeah. give or take. Yeah. Whereas in this, because you've got two completely different teams, you could have the fastest team at the halfway split suddenly become the slowest team or slower team and things can change quickly or the slowest team suddenly become fast. Like the German men probably didn't ride to their best ability. They had some big powerhouses. And the women, yeah, were another level. So... Swings and roundabouts, and I, I quite like that dynamic of it's it's quite unexpected, and you you have the both sides of the coin to play with. Um, and I guess with the the new UCI ruling around trade teams on the track, and probably effectively we're banned in just over nine months' time, means yeah. we'll probably focus more on these kind of races. Yeah, yeah, it's a good thing to have to focus on though. Oh yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy it, and hopefully GB gives us the opportunity to get our teeth stuck in again next yeah. year. Yeah, exactly. Just touching briefly, I know you're a, a Zwifter. You won a couple of the Zwift mm. Classics. Um, again, wh- how does Zwift fit into your your training, or does it? I think it's just like a, a good mix. And throughout winter, we found it as like a nice opportunity to let's be pin a number on. Yeah. So we're involved in the the Kiss Super League back yep. in January, February, March, and. Yep. It's kind of an odd time of the year. It's in the track season, road season's obviously coming, and I guess it's just a good hard training session. Myself and John were quite literally set up in the corridor, <laughs> head to head <laughs> with each other, and obviously riding as a team, so you're talking tactics, you're on the limit, but it's just fun, real yeah. good fun. Yeah. I think that's the thing. Like, yeah, everyone loves racing, but it kind of brings it to home, makes life nice and easy. You just yeah. jump on your, your turbo, your walk bike, and away you go. Yeah, exactly. I say, well, good, good job on the uh, at the world here in Yorkshire. Just touching briefly on what's next this year, rest of 2019. World Cups, track World Cups. So we've got straight in Belarus in six weeks. Week after Glasgow, our home World Cup. So I've been to put in a real good ride there. Then off to Brisbane. It's nice and sunny. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Get away from British winter. Got the World nice. Cup there. Going to spend a few weeks after exploring with Joss and having a bit of fun. Then yeah. back to, to the grind towards nationals, world champs on the track, hopefully. And then having a go at some world records in Bolivia in April. Nice one. You may mention about girlfriend with Joss. Joss Loudon. You yeah. Do, yeah. Um, obviously, my, my wife, uh, we do a lot of cycling together. Yeah. How do you find that training together? Oh, she kicks my head in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Some days it's just, like, you want an easy zone two ride and she just wants to chase every single yeah. KOM up a hill and it's like, oh no, not, yeah, not exactly. again. Yeah, exactly. Not again. Yeah. Um, but she goes well and you can honestly, genuinely ride together. And I think yeah. that's a great thing that you kind of spend a bit more time but on the bikes, but it's not like a big disparity. You can just enjoy riding together. Yeah. So you can train together, not yeah. just ride together. Yeah. yeah exactly. Of awesome. All right, mate. Well, good, good to chat. And we'll chat to you again on another podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers for having me. There we go. Again, little insight there into Dan. Obviously, very interesting character and a very smart uh, bike rider. Uh, definitely someone we'll have on a future podcast at some point. But yeah, mo- moving. So I think that's the, that's the mixed TT event. What was the next event? It was the junior, junior time trials, obviously the up and coming riders. Plenty of you know, strong performances there. Um, but we've, we, our next chat is with the, yeah, the women's time trial. Um, obviously, won by Avid Zwifter. Chloe Digart, obviously coached by by our very own Kristen Armstrong, kind of a, a, a dream team right there. Uh, yeah, I think between them, they kind of sp- yeah, sp- speak volumes, really. They, they're a great, great duo, and it's a really interesting chat. So let's, let's get into that. Hello, everyone. Um, here today we have newly crowned world champion Chloe Digart in the individual time trial. Chloe, welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so it's been not even 24 hours since... You were on the top step of the podium, listening to the national anthem. How are you feeling? Yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been pretty crazy actually. I'm feeling pretty good, but you know, looking forward to uh, Tokyo now and the road race this weekend. Yeah, actually, congratulations. You know, um, a lot of people might not know, but not only did Chloe Digert become the world champion yesterday, but also she earned a spot to Tokyo, which for an athlete is just an amazing lift off the shoulders. Um, you know, knowing that you can go into the Olympic year not having the pressure of having to prove yourself one last time. How does that feel? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a big load off, um, especially, you know, hearing stories from you and your past and what you've had to deal with. And so, you know, really having the just freedom to really just prepare 
for that race specifically, instead of having to worry about every other little detail, um, it's just a huge load off. And I think it's going to just really set up the Olympics even more perfect. So looking forward to it. Yeah, I bet that feels really good. You know, it just kind of clears your mind. And so full disclosure for everyone, you know, you might have seen this, but the full disclosure is that I happen to coach Chloe. Um, I have for several years now. And so some of our conversation today, you know, it will become, it will be a little personal and I'll know a little more than, than most. But Chloe, when you woke up and you were watching the U23 men race, and we all saw the race, it was filled with puddles at you know, it may be potential flooding. There were several racers that went down. And at a world championship, that's the last thing you hope for anyone to have anything happen like that. You know, the mishaps, the uh, uncontrollables. What went through your mind prior to your race yesterday? Uh, definitely a lot of things went through my mind. But I think, you know, one of the biggest things was not really letting it get to me, letting it bother me, you know, like I ride in the rain all the time in Washington. I'm used to it. And I, I just, I, I think obviously it's world championships too. It's, it's a huge race. It's, um, the adrenaline's going and the, you know, definitely I was nervous for the race, but I wasn't nervous for the conditions. I, I knew I could handle myself in the rain. I knew, I knew the turns. I knew what I needed to do. I knew where I needed to be in my bars. I knew where I needed to be out. I knew if I saw a puddle, I wasn't going to ride through it. You know, I, I just, I was very well prepared. I, I wasn't, I wasn't nervous at all knowing that it was raining, that it was wet, that it was flooded, that it was, there was slick paint. Um, I was very confident in my ability to get through that course safely. Um, it was just a matter of my legs could do it as well. Yeah, that's fascinating how you just mentioned a number of thoughts and characteristics that you have as an athlete. I think that a lot of athletes, even your competitors, struggle with at times. Um, I want to get back to those points in just a minute, but prior to that, I want you to take us through the course yesterday. Did you get time splits? Were the roads slick? Take us through for those who weren't able to watch, for those who weren't able to see you in person, take us through the course. Yeah. Uh, starting out, uh, we were told the start ramp was going to be slick. Um, so I, you know, thought about that. I was like, okay, maybe take it a little easy. And I had, uh, Ina in the, in the radio telling me to just, you know, take this first little bit chill. Um, it was, uh, off the ramp. And then like 25 meters later was kind of a sharp left-hand turn, um, into a like a little cobble section downhill. So it was going to be slick and uh, make sure you, obviously you don't want to screw yourself in that little bit. Um, so it just took that, you know, safe and got through it. Um, went in through the first roundabout and got in the bars and, and that's really when the race started. There was about 10 speed bumps within the first mile of the race. That was, um, you know, figuring out beforehand whether to stay in the bars or to, to get out. And, um, you know, figured out it was just to be best to stay in the bars and, uh, got thrown around a lot, but, uh, I was able to stay in and, um, finally getting onto that, that, uh, first little bit, uh, before the climb started, there was going to be 25 times where I had planned that I was going to cross the road, cross over the road, cross over the middle line. And those middle lines had, uh, little sharp, little reflectors that, um, we were really worried about pre-riding that we would flat if we hit them. And, um, so we were definitely nervous and I, I, I watched video. I went on pre-riding, figured out how many times I was going to have to cross and, uh, you know, see if, you know, where my line was going to be. So I wouldn't hit those and watching the U23 men, seeing their lines, them really not having any issues. And then me finally getting out there with a closed road. Um, it was actually, uh, you know, didn't even, uh, I, I think maybe it came close to hitting one, one time. And so it was, it was a, a worry for no reason. Um, and you know, ended up being perfectly fine. And, uh, but you know, again, I think my confidence for this race really, really was lifted. Um, you know, my ability to turn to, uh, you know, especially in the rain, um, you know, just, I, I had complete confidence in, in my bike and, um, handling and, you know, going down the descents. Of course I was being safe, but I, I, I was really, really pushing it. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got every second I could possibly get. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't have any time splits until about halfway. Um, but again, it also, you know, the, the best riders were still to come. So I was about 5k out when I heard, um, in the radio that I had about a minute gap and, um, hearing that 
I, I thought it was great. It was exciting, but I also knew that they were going to climb next. And I knew that was probably the time that they were going to, um, they were, that was where they were going to gain their time on me. And so I just, I, I pushed as hard as I possibly could all the way to the finish line and, um, yeah, just did what I could. Wow. You know, what I take away from everything you just said was there's so often that athletes and, and coaches, everyone seems to think that the physical training is where it's at. And I think that we were able to take this in a different direction in that the physical training truly is where you need to be. It's just a given. But everything you just explained had nothing to do with your physical ability. It had to do with knowing the course. It had to do with having confidence in the technical aspects. It had to know, uh, it had to do with just setting it up and not worrying about your competitors. You weren't the last to go off. You didn't have time checks. Every one of your competitors had time checks, the ones who were really in the game. And so that just really reiterates and confirms that the physical piece of training is important. But at the end of the day, when you're racing on a world-class level, you have to have that just as a given, as a baseline. You have to show up to the race, and then everything else comes. But I would challenge people and, and racers out there to really – I would, I bet you most people, I bet you 90, over 95% of people who are racing out there are not taking apart and dissecting the course like Chloe has just explained to us. It's, it's fascinating to me, you know, in the confidence. So with that confidence, tell me, what were you telling yourself in your mind? You know, time trialing is a race against the clock. It's, we call it the race of truth. And to be out there for 42 minutes, what do you, talk about I mean, what do you do how do you not think about what you're gonna do after the race or what you're hungry for I mean you know how our mind starts to drift you know just let alone in five minutes of our day what were you thinking out there you know I, I remember back in Richmond there was a time in that time trial it was a 20 minute time trial and I remember zoning out for like I don't even remember how long it was just you know, 30 some seconds and it was I was catching catching my minute girl and I remember oh I got this it's it's fine I, I don't need to worry about it and I remember zoning out and in this race I did not zone out one time I was focused I you know I, I knew I, I could probably play back all my thoughts that I had you know I, I they were all constructive they were all you know thinking about especially the, the biggest thing that I came away from this race was what we talked about the the day before you know am I hurting as bad as everybody else and that really pushed me pushed my limits you know when I was climbing yes I knew I had the lightest bike I could possibly have yes I, I got my weight to where I needed to be to be able to climb but I knew that those girls were still going to be able to climb more than me and I knew I need to push as hard as I can without blowing myself. And I really tried to push my limits as much as I possibly could because I needed to make sure that I was hurting more than everybody else the entire race. And um, I think, I know I, you've probably told me that before and I've probably just blown it off, but this being such an important, crucial race in, 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 this, in my career, um, hearing you say that and, you know, actually, you know, using that in the race really was a game changer. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that was one of the, the biggest things that I thought about the entire way. Wow. That gives me the goosebumps because what you've just told me as your coach is it made me just feel for just one second that maybe I was racing yesterday. Like, you, like, like I've shared something that you have taken along the course, which, wow, that was crazy. That's awesome. I, it makes me feel really good. Because, you know, as a coach, I can write workouts for you all day long, but, you know, you do them, you're, you're, you comply. And, you know, then you think, well, as a coach, what can I do to make it any different for Chloe? And it's the same thing. It's like, I don't want to be the coach that just says, good luck. I mean, what is that? I mean, everyone wants good luck. And I think it's like great to say it. it's kind of like saying hello to somebody. But what are those little nuggets that I can do? And, you know, if I tell you good job every time, it's like, well, what does it mean anymore? And so... I'm always trying to think of different ways other than just physically giving you a workout. Um, and so that, that means a lot. I <clears throat> appreciate that. And so obviously something that has come out to the public now is the fact that um, we decided to go against using a power meter. Now, 
10 years ago, I think people would be like, yeah, you know, some people don't have power meters, but today it's kind of like your phone. I don't think that people leave the house without their power on. In fact, the number of messages I've received as a coach regarding when a writer's technology isn't working or pairing, wow, it almost like debilitates them prior to even getting on their bike. Talk us through the choice of not using a power meter, what your initial response was when that was suggested, and how it worked out for you. Yeah, definitely. I remember in in Rio finding out that you didn't use a power meter in your race, and uh, I remember thinking, there is no way I would ever ride without a power meter, (laughs) ever. No way. And I remember, you know, several times this year having power meter issues and just being so stressed about it and, you know, still being able to perform and, and, and do well. And, um, you know, and I, I also think we grew together as um, a coach and an athlete getting through so many humps that our relationship grew as, you know, our trust and my trust in you. And I, I, I really think things just really came together for us and, um, you know, I, I knew you had mentioned it before as, as taking, you know, taking the power meter off for weight and, um, thinking about it and, you know, I guess it, you know, it could be a possibility, could be a possibility. And, um, you know, I, I remember racing at Pan Am games, looking down at my power meter at the beginning of the race and, and seeing these high numbers. I'm like, Oh, I'm going out way too hard. I need to, I need to back it off. And then, you know, my second half of the race ended up being harder than the first half because I still had something left in the tank. And so I realized, you know, all the power meter does is just in some ways just restricts you. And, um, so when that, when you finally just said, you know, we're not going to race the power meter, it really wasn't even like a, you know, I didn't even think about fighting it. I just, you know what, she knows what's best, obviously. (laughs) So, um, you know, we just went with it and I had complete confidence. I mean, but you know, all around, not just. in in me, but like, I knew my training was where it needed to be. I I, I knew, you know, just everything beyond just riding the bike, my, my mental state, everything was just where it needed to be. And, um, that was just, you know, one, one other thing that just, I I knew it wasn't going to be a bother. It wasn't going to be a problem. I, I just, I had complete faith and trust in, in, in what you were wanting out of it. No pressure here. Um, so, you know, we've heard and we've read a lot about Chloe. We've we've read about, you know, a little bit of snippets of her background. We've read a little bit of snippets about, wow, all the setbacks she's had in the last 18 months. And I, I can bring it back and say in the last five years. However, I want to I wanna leave that for another chat with Chloe. Um, however, what I do want to touch on before we wrap up here, Chloe, is you talked about the trust, you talk about the confidence you have, you talked about how your weight was right, you talked about how your mindset was right, the physical part was right, your equipment was right. Oh my goodness. Bring us back just a few weeks prior to the world championships. And what does that preparation look like in order to set up your mind and to give you that confidence? What are those little nuggets that you took and and you applied and you practiced leading up and so your fitness was at x level coming in three weeks prior we knew we were on point what are those things that an athlete at your level in order to perform because I think a lot of people their psyche gets inside of them and they they can't handle the stress and they overthink and they overdo. And so talk to us about the last couple of weeks of Chloe. Yeah, you know, I think after the concussion, things definitely changed, but I, I, I think the moment my mindset really, really just got in the game was after Pan Am Games. And I, I remember at the beginning of the year, um, you know, like right now sitting here thinking about the entire year, it, it's completely obvious that you knew exactly what you were doing the entire year. This race was what we were working towards. There was no point in pushing anything else. You know, we made it our goal to get here and to win this race, to be able to qualify for the Olympic games. And 
you know, at the beginning of the year and being who I am, I just want to go out and win everything and be good at all times. And I think, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, that was, that was hard for me because I just, I, I don't think I understood what your plans were and, and what we were doing and why I wasn't, you know, where I thought I should be. And I, I think that's where, you know, finally getting on the track, going to Pan Ams and, and, and getting that strength back right, you know, I, that, that gave me confidence, but then it also gave me confidence, you know, in, in more trust in you, you know, it's, it's like, I, I think, yeah, I, I can have good days on the bike and, uh, you know, whatever, but my mindset change changes when I have the trust in you and, 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 you know, in the coaches, it's, it's like, you know, yeah, I can perform well on the bike, but if, if, you know, I don't have that, that mindset that, oh, you know, what if this wasn't what I needed to do? What if I should have gone a little easier today? You know, I, I, I just knew that you knew what you were doing. I did not doubt anything at all. And I think that was just the biggest thing for me was just the, the trust that I had and what you had planned for me. And, um, I, I knew that, you know, even if I lacked motivation to get out and ride today, it was, you know, world championships is the goal. Like this was our, this is what we had worked for all year. And I couldn't, I couldn't just give up because I had one bad session, one bad day. Um, you know, even that day that we were riding, um, the week before when we did those threshold efforts up, up your, uh, highway, <laughs> you sitting on my wheel the whole time. Um, that really frustrated me. <laughs> I was, that was a, <laughs> <laughs> that was a hard workout for me to get over. Um, but you know, not that I needed any, you know, pick me ups or, Oh, that, you know, that was still good, whatever. Um, but you know, and then the, the next day I did that, that time trial, um, the mock time trial with you and, uh, you know, through the ride, it was like, Oh, this is just awful. I, I feel terrible. You know, I, I just, I didn't think I was there. I wasn't ready. I remember getting out of the car and, or you getting out of the car and me getting off my bike and, you know, just, just your face and, and, uh, you know, you don't, you didn't even really need to say anything. You just, you know, you're ready, you're ready. And that's all I needed to know. You know, I, that, that was what I needed to hear. You know, I, I don't need to be praised. I don't need to be told good job. I just needed to be told like, you know what, you're ready. You're, you're there. You're going to be, you're going to be fine. And I, that's just what I needed. That's, and that's how I got through this week. Just the trust. Yeah, that's awesome. I think trust is something that is really important. Also, often, you know, you hear different people who have invested in in coaching and um, they're, you know, you hook up with them for a ride. And the first thing they say is, oh, this is really not what I'm supposed to be doing today. And I'm like, wow, like, you got to find someone you trust uh, in order to perform. And it, it is a team effort. It takes both not only the athlete and the coach, but there's a huge team behind it. You know, there's Chloe's trade team, 2020 show air. There's definitely performance partners that we have. Um, there are just a number of partners out there that Chloe works with, you know, Red Bull's all about performance. So as we know, and as we've heard from Chloe today, it, it does take a team and confidence is what she's saying carried her to that top step, which I can all well appreciate. So, so Chloe, um, without further ado, I know in, um, this myself, and I know the, the, what training environment you have at times. And one of the things prior to, um, saying goodbye to everyone today and uh, once again, good job. Tell us what in 30 seconds, tell us what Zwift has done for you being from a very rainy climate out of Seattle, Washington, how has this changed your motivation to ride when it's wet, it's dark? And how do you see Zwift, you know, being a tool in your toolkit moving forward? Yeah, Zwift has definitely been a game changer for me. Uh, you know, I mean, yes, even with the weather, the uh, but also the concussion last year, you know, not being able to ride outside. So having that, uh, Zwift as the option to ride inside really just made things so much easier. And, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's been, even if it is nice outside, you know, if I have a quality workout that needs to be done using Zwift is just the perfect tool. 
Awesome. Um, again, Chloe, congratulations on yesterday's performance. It was absolutely game-changing. You made history. You won by the largest margin in history. Um, last one who did that was Kanchalara. Um, and so good job. I want to wish you the best of luck in the road race on Saturday. I know that everyone is going to be watching Chloe Digert. Chloe Digert might not have raced in Europe prior to this. However, everyone has their eyes on you. And I look forward to talking with you again and getting even deeper around how you've overcome injury as well as how was Chloe raised? What was her background like? How did she become somebody from living in Indiana in a small town to Olympic silver medalist in 2016? And now she's on her road to Tokyo to becoming a gold medalist, that top step of that podium in the Olympic Games, the pinnacle of sport. Thanks, Chloe. Thank you. And for, for me, the key words that Chloe kept mentioning was trust, you know, trust in her coach and that being a coaching team. Um, and, you know, as, as we all know, it's, it's not just about the rider on the bike doing the performance, it's the team around them. Yeah, and I think that's why you see so many world-class coaches with a cycling background because they've been there and done it. And I think that that trust is so, so important. If you believe in what you're doing, that's half the battle. And I think that's what Chloe's obviously found with Kristen. And I was lucky enough to actually commentate on the last race that Chloe rode in Colorado. And she won four out of the four stages and she was so dominant. And it was really interesting for me to then see how she performed then in the European scene. She doesn't race much in Europe, and it is different to racing in the States, yeah. but, you know, clearly head and shoulders above the rest. And I actually think she's got a really good chance in the road race. She's a phenomenal rider, obviously coming from a track background, but she's worked so, so hard on this event. And that's what Kristen used to do. She didn't have to race in Europe, but she knew exactly what she had to do to be dominant um, on the day in a time trial. And that's what's so nice about a time trial. It's so measurable. You can see a course and plan and know exactly how you want to execute that ride to put yourself in the b best position to ultimately win the race. And that's what she's done. And I think it's quite nice to see her upset the, the Dutch dominance that we've seen in the last few years. So is her not racing Europe, is that an intentional thing or is that just a lack of opportunity? I think it's actually an intentional thing. I think she likes being in the States, family, um, and have that kind of, I guess, support network around her with the national team on the track. Obviously for next year, it'll be really interesting in terms of where she puts all her focus. I think it will be on the track. Um, so I think that's a key part of why she stays where she is. And obviously now she's found this almost dream team of, of coach and rider with Kristen and is clearly, you know, talking so highly about that relationship in terms of where it's putting her on a performance side of things. I think she'll stay there because it's obviously working. So, yeah, so there's a good example of in professional cycling, quite often a rider is given to a coach and it's a false relationship. But when that relationship is found, there's that mutual respect there. There's that trust that you speak about and this is the result of it. So certainly a fantastic effort from both of them. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the amount of times that Chloe's referenced, you know, Tokyo, that is the the big goal. And, you know, you don't want don't to jinx anything, but she's going to be there or thereabouts, you'd say. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I guess the only problem with that is now is she's proven to the world how dominant she is and can be. So unlike this year where people were talking about her, but she was relatively, you know, an underdog, as it were, to beat the likes of Van der Breggen or, or Van Vluten in the Dutch squad. Next year, all eyes are going to be on her and she will hold that pressure then of having the rainbow jersey leading into an Olympics, mm -hmm. which I know exactly how that kind of feels. And she's going to have to just be really, really super focused on again what she knows works and not worrying too much about having that pressure on her shoulders and just going out there and riding the bike you know like she's doing now and that's really fast <laughs> yeah. I guess in, in a way you know she is the world champion now for future events but what actually changes nothing she still goes out and completes her event it's all kind of an internal mental mental battle yeah it is very mental and like you say not nothing it, but... yeah nothing will change from that perspective but again i don't know what the US are like in terms of demands. I know, you know, if you win a world championship, you do become almost a star in the limelight. Your time, you know, 
people are asking you to do podcasts and interviews and then that will have a bearing on potential training time resting time whether that had will have then a knock-on effect for the road race in a few days time we don't know and that's what she will have to overcome in the next year um but ultimately like you say in terms of the bike riding and the training nothing should change because it's clearly working for her mm, yeah she's uh miles ahead of the rest of the field isn't she there's yeah daylight second really absolutely yeah um moving on to the men's time trial event kev your, your man i mean you've worked wonders with dousa there top top wide his best ever in, in a world championships yeah well, obviously um alex came into the event uh fully focused on this and he made the comment afterwards that he was he actually used the word dubious of the training uh we we use some methods that are i guess relatively unorthodox and new like we do a lot of our sessions on zwift on the ergo replicating the demands of the event so alex was actually up in andorra training on zwift for this event i was in australia watching him do the sessions and talking to him um during the session and providing feedback and yeah the result is fifth place his best best result in the world championship yeah i think that's amazing amazing result for alex i've known alex since we were younger i remember being at a national time trial event and asking alex for any tips because i was about to ride the time trial so he's always been that time trial specialist but i think it's been great to see this year him really step up and focus purely on the world championships and you know today's event being a qualifier as well for the Olympics next year, which I th thought was really interesting, finding mm. out that the top 10 in today's World Championships guarantee your nation two spots at the Olympics. I think yeah. a lot of nations would have been really focused on this year's time trial. So I think, yeah, that's a fantastic result for Alex. And I've seen on social media, he's really happy with his performance. Yeah, so yeah, top yeah. coach there, Kev. Yeah, well, look, it's obviously a good project. And I guess as an example, we can let the listeners know that he was doing uh, a one-hour session with 88 intervals in that one-hour session. So different steps, which replicated the demands of the undulating course we had today in, in the race. And just to expand on that a little bit, Kev, those 88 steps, why 88? Where, where, did that, where did that come from? That was pretty much how the course was broken down to in terms of different um, portions of gradient, uh, different durations of power that was needed. So it was always... Um, changing rhythm so you, know, you could jump on the ergo and you could do your you know your 220s or your 140 minute effort and that steady state stuff but the time trial wasn't steady state so his training on the ergo was replicating the climbing the cadence the talk um, yeah and just that never getting into a nice comfortable rhythm that we, that we um, um, focused on for today and here is the chat with the man himself Alex Dosit. Alex uh, look I'm super happy for you but can you tell us about your ride today it was uh, definitely split into three three parts as we expected the first sort of 20k was was flat um, quite fast just kind of settle in stick to a sort of tried to stick to around 420 watts um, kind of working out where the legs were and then then after that you started getting grippy very up and down um, and that was possibly a bit more up and down than I was anticipating as in you'd have to really lay into the ups and then more recovery on the downs than um, I sort of thought was kind of, which was nice. Yeah. Um, and then a bolt for home, which was real horrible, yeah. but yeah. it was it was great. You know, crowds were mad. Yeah. Uh, definitely <laughs> fetched a few watts over the top of Kimes, thanks to the crowd. So I really appreciate that. And top five's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, top five is your best result at Worlds, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, was, uh, I got eighth in my first ever Worlds back like when I was a child, so um, nice to finally do a bit better than that. Nice Worlds well, is a second coming, isn't it, for you? Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of effort went into this, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, obviously, grateful to British Cycling for the work they put in, grateful to you, Kev, for the work you put in. Um, you know, this was a real labour of love, and you just, you hope for good legs on the day, and because uh, this is the one kind of, um, you can control it to a point, but then some days you just wake up feeling magical, some days you wake up feeling horrible and you just want something around normal or better. Yeah. And today was normal or better. Okay, one more question. Uh, at what point in the ride today did you feel that, okay, I'm on a good day today, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the race here? Uh, well, Matt was down the radio saying, like, it's close. Um, and I, think I was getting checks to Durbridge early on and I was four seconds down at the first check so I was like that's that's okay we've got another significant section coming and then I turned that 
we'll sort of turn that around quite a bit in the middle sector. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just then bolted home and then you just, it's all, it doesn't really matter what feedback you're getting right at the end, you just, you know, quicker you finish, the quicker it's all over, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks very much and congratulations once again. Thanks, Kevin. I think that's really interesting, actually, looking at today's course. A lot of the people I spoke to before the event were saying how pacing was so critical because unlike, I guess, maybe a standard time trial that is flat, a rider will know how much power they need to produce for the duration of that time trial. But the difference of today was it was so undulating. And if that rider went too hard on some of the inclines, they were going to really pay for it later on. And being Mm -hmm. 54 kilometres, one of the longest in you know, the world championship history of time trialing, you know, that was so paramount. So to break it up and train for the demands of the event is so crucial, especially in a time trial. So yeah. And you know, we've heard from two riders who have produced world class rides who have, you know, got very different styles there. You know, one having those eighty eight steps uh, without it. And then Chloe not even using a power meter. And both you know, both producing world class rides. It goes to show I guess there's no right way. There's a right way for you. Yeah, but it comes back to that confidence that, that you get with your athletes. So when they have that trust in you, um, look, there's so many different ways to achieve the same result. Uh, we could have done 10 different things with Alex, but this is the path we went down. We committed to that and we, yeah. and we saw it through. It's the same with Chloe, what she's doing with Kristen. They've got a, a technique that works for them. So why change something that's working? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, this is pl- plenty to come. Just touching on the atmosphere so far. I mean, we've based ourselves at the Zwift House quite a bit. Um, you've had uh, ex-pros coming in. There's the ex-pro race tonight uh, that uh, Jan Tobarko won. You had Alessandro Balan in there. Pretty good atmosphere. What, what do you make of what do you make of Yorkshire, Kev? I'm actually pretty impressed. Like, I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> <You sound> surprised. <laughs> oh, I am surprised. Well, I've got to say, I was driving out in the women's course today, following Ella Harris around, and I thought this is a nice little place here. Mm. It was much like New Zealand. There's lots of sheep on the side of the road. Yeah. <laughs> Bit like Wales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice. No, great place. Yeah, it's been absolutely amazing to see what show Harrogate has put on I was lucky enough to ride in the tour of Yorkshire last year so I knew that it was going to be such an incredible spectacle it's such a cycling hub in the UK and everyone's really got behind the world championships I think it's great for the nation there's a lot of initiatives in terms of trying to inspire people to just get on a bike rather than to focus on even the performance side of bike riding I've been super busy which has been absolutely great i got into the zwift house today absolutely incredible setup such a cool vibe everyone seems to be heading there in and around the races um so yeah so far loving it with so much still to come lovely well guys let's uh let's catch up tomorrow we'll have some new guests and more world chat see you tomorrow thank you